This is uh, the first chat in a series that we call a London Business School uh, Fireside Chat. And our first uh, guest speaker is uh, Mr. Don Gogol. <clears throat> he is the chairman of private equity firm Clayton Dublier and Rice. And he will be speaking today to our students and, and answering any questions that you might have. Uh, Mr. Gogol has been with the firm for 32 years. He has served as a chief executive officer from 98 to 2019. And also now he is a chairman of the, of the company since 2012. <clears throat> Besides being a chairman, Mr. Gogol is also a member of the investment committee and plays an active role in shaping the firm's strategy, recruiting the talent and sourcing the new investment opportunities that uh, private equity firms always um, worry about. Uh, my name is Florin Vazbury. I'm the academic director of the London Business School uh, Institute of Entrepreneurship and Private Capital. And I also teach private equity and venture capital at the school. And I'm, I'm sure that some of you already know me or, or will be taking my class sooner or later. Uh, in the benefit of time, I'd like to get started. So uh, Don, thanks for joining us today. Uh, from New York. Really appreciate your time. I know you're very busy and uh, our students are very thankful for having you here. <clears throat> and um, just to get started, you've been in private equity for, for a long time, for over 30 years, and obviously you've been in investing through a lot of market cycles. And um, I wanted to ask you what, what made this most recent cycle different from the others that you've seen? And Kind of what are the lessons that you have learned from this most recent one and uh, you can share with all of us here? Well, almost everything changes in private equity every number of years. And I've lived through six discernible cycles. Some of the cycles like the Great Recession, some of them the dot-com bust and the most recent one, of course, COVID. But all of those changes take place against many changes happening on the private equity firms as well. Among the ones I'd note, and this just sets up the answers to your questions about what's different this time, mm -hmm. is first, the firms are much bigger. Certainly Clayton Dublier is much larger. When I joined the firm in 1989, we were investing out of a $300 million fund and we had five partners. Mm -hmm. Today we have 30 full-time partners, and we're investing out of a $16 billion fund. So it's a 50x size increase. And that, as you'll see, will have some impact on how we can respond to these crises. And so scale really does matter. And as you saw through 2021, the speed at which private equity firms, and to be fair, many public companies as well, regain their balance against what was a precipitous drop in activity starting about 18 months ago and really lasting three to six months was really breathtaking. I think few of us could have thought that the rebound would be so quick. Remember, private equity doesn't follow necessarily the same pace as public equity markets. So the ups and downs can be both either longer drawn out or quicker to rebound. And in this particular period, I think the rebound in the PE firms was very, very, very rapid. And now every cycle, of course, is unique. And this one being driven by a global health crisis had some unique characteristics, but when you translate all of that into the basic blocking and tackling of business, there are more commonalities than differences, whether caused by COVID or some other macroeconomic crisis or fiscal or monetary crisis. And I say that because when things get translated down to the level of a PE firm or our portfolio companies, the commonality is, has to do with the basic metrics of how a business is performing. Your revenues, your profitability, your cost base, your customer retention, whether you're gaining share, your ability to respond to the crisis, uh, all of that is quite similar when you're looking at uh, not the cause of the crisis, but the nature of the responsiveness. And Fortunately, PE, because it is a relatively nimble 
unencumbered asset class with investors that by definition have a much longer time frame than public company executives. Uh, just the PE firms have the ability to look past the immediate crisis and more or less say, how do we respond so that we will come out at the other end, whether that end is three months, six months, or two years, as a stronger company with the ability to hold employment, gain share, increase profitability, and ultimately move towards a valuable exit on behalf of our investors. So we keep that in mind. And as I think of the parallels of previous crises, there's more in common then there is a distinctiveness of what we've just been through. Now, that said, I don't want to minimize the somewhat unique impact on the mental wellness and ability of certain subgroups in our populations around the world to recover since the impact on the economy and profitability or stock price doesn't tell you the full story. The personal impact in many, many lives has been very, very uh, difficult, shall I say, challenging, and in some cases worse. And so we have to keep in mind that we're still operating in an environment in which recovery, although measured by business metrics, looks pretty good, measured in social and econo social socioeconomic measures, particularly for some of our most vulnerable populations, is still not good at all. So even though you're going to hear from me a pretty good story of PE responding to crisis, I don't want that to uh, obscure the challenges that many of our societies still face in establishing social solidarity and in getting the right level of participation and inclusion of our entire societies, because the recovery has not been uniform across many pop segments of our population or those of any of our uh, investor countries around the world, whether in Europe or in Asia. Uh, okay, thank you so much, uh, Don. I mean, I, I, indeed, the, the private equity industry um, did pretty well uh, last year and even this year. I mean, the, the fundraising has been quite high. And then, in fact, the valuations of, of companies in, in private equity have been quite high. And uh, I was wondering, you know, whether, whether this environment where we are, you know, part of the economy is in a crisis where the other part is actually booming and doing pretty well, especially on the technology side and private equity and other, other aspects. Uh, I was wondering whether you are worried about this very high valuations that we see today and whether you know you think these, these valuations at some point will adjust and, and potentially hurt uh, in the future the private equity firms that deploy capital these days? Well, those are perennial questions that anyone that's been in private equity for the three decades that I have been would tell you that those are always present. You know, of course, as an investor and a buyer of companies, I always think prices are too high. As a seller, I tend to think they're too low. But since we both buy and sell, we try to seek an equilibrium in the capital that we are deploying in new investments and the ability to take advantage of what seems to be sometimes in some segments, higher valuation to sell businesses and return capital to our investors. It's hard not to worry in this current environment. Caution is an appropriate emotion. In some cases, we are looking at historical highs uh, on almost every measure. Even if you take the technology sector, which has a unique set of dynamics in which people are measuring growth rates in double digits, or even in some cases, 50, 100% year over year, in which case, traditional standards of EPS, or even truthfully, multiples of revenue apply less. But in the vast majority of companies that I would consider uh, both the targets for private equity, but also the standard business of companies around the world and that are typically listed firms, this has been a, a somewhat unusual period, both with the rapidity of the recovery, primary demand, caused by the relative health of the balance sheets of consumers as well as companies. As you remember, 
we went through a liquidity crisis and terrible balance sheets in 2009. So here we find ourselves with the opposite. Cash is just enormously available. Liquidity is everywhere. Uh, pent up demand is pushing prices higher, creating an inflationary environment that we truthfully haven't seen in arguably 20 years or more. And those are all, I won't call danger signals, but it's certainly a yellow flag that says, don't assume that the next year or two or five is gonna look like the last five, regardless of the pandemic and regardless of the relatively health of the public markets. I think as you look at some of the sources of what has fueled both our activity and, and many other private equity firms, it's hard to miss some of the traditional sources of monetary policy because rates are as low today as they've been any time in my 30 plus years in private equity. Many of our levered capital structures still have a total cost of capital of 7%, let's say, and that's for a fairly levered company. I've lived through periods in which our total levered cost of capital was closer to 13%. So literally half of the cost of capital to deploy leverage to buy companies. And that has historically uh, it just been, it's unprecedented. Now that has led to the increase in prices. It also is leading to some of the caution as all of that activity at very high multiples begs the question, can it be sustained? And will companies be able to be sold at similarly lofty valuations three, four, five years from now than they are today when conditions inevitably are going to be different in, in many places. The biggest change I would say if today versus when we were having, if we were having this conversation a year ago has to be inflation. A year ago, despite many predictions, including my own, that this low interest rate period had to be coming to an end soon. It didn't, or at least soon, certainly wasn't in 2020. It's not gonna be in 2021. And central banks in the United States and Europe and elsewhere are keeping a dovish monetary policy. And there's no question that if you were to try to draw correlations between valuations and federal policy or, or central bank policies elsewhere, you probably get the highest R square of almost any variable. So we can't forget that that is driving a lot of our activity today. And there's every indication that it will end sooner rather than later, but the rapidity of the increase in, in uh, rates is still unknown, but the direction is clearer and the timing is getting tighter. And that clearly will have some relatively, I hope minor, but significant um, hedging, as you can tell, because I don't know how big yeah. it will be, but it'll, it'll, it'll clearly impact valuations. And, and that's a source of concern. And I think most experienced investors in private equity recognize that. And I'd like to think there'll be some self-restraint and mitigation in multiples paid. And take technology out of the equation, I think some of that is evident in the last six months, if not in technology in more traditional industrial and slower growth businesses. So we're hopeful, of course, that companies don't find themselves over levered, that we don't go through a period of defaults and disruption, uh, which of course would be terrible for companies, investors, societies. But I think we may escape here if we don't let this inflationary spiral carry us all to heights in which we lose some of our judgment. Indeed. I think the press today or yesterday announced that the inflation in the UK is at an all time high, like a 10 year high, which is obviously a great signal that the interest rates are about to go up. Sometimes when I teach, I talk about the rule of 12 and I don't know to what extent uh, is credible, but the rule of 12 is that uh, multiple paid for companies' valuations plus the interest rates equal 12. 
historically, the interest rates have been 4%, and uh, my EBITDA multiples have been eight times. So eight plus four has been 12. Recently, interest rates have been zero, and EBITDA multiples have been 12. So if the interest rates go up, hopefully the multiples will, uh, I don't know if they follow the rules, but um, to some extent, uh, it's interesting whether that uh, rule of thumb actually works or not. Uh, switching gears a little bit, I, uh, given that we are in the UK here, I wanted to ask you about the political cost that private equity sometimes needs to face. So 2021 has been a very active year in private equity, including for, for your firm. And you made a couple of investments, amongst which two of them in the UK, uh, one in healthcare, one in, in a grocery, um, Morrison's chain. And as you might expect, this has generated some skeptical responses, uh, you know, from the media and some political stakeholders. And I wanted to ask your opinion about, you know, what you think about the press and, and you know, this, the, the love and hate relationship that they have with the private equity. Well, fortunately, those of us experienced in the private equity field have learned over the years not to read too much into press coverage, mm -hmm. either the positive, which to be fair is less common, or the negative, which is probably more common, uh, not because they're not smart journalists covering important matters, but rather some of the coverage, I think, misses the, some of the underlying elements of what really is driving private equity and truthfully merger and acquisition activity more broadly. The numbers are very high. Globally, this is just one measure, $200 billion of public to private transactions occurred in the last year. And so inevitably that level of activity is going to push uh, a lot of people to say, well, what's going on here? And particularly when the acquisition, the companies that are acquired are iconic companies of which Morrison is one, there's a question of, is this gonna be healthy? Is this sort of private equity overreaching? And will there be a negative impact on the company and on the broader constituencies uh, that Morrison is in the center of? But we would not have made that acquisition in the absence of having a strong positive point of view about the health longer term of both the British economy, consumers and our loyal customers at Morrison's, and importantly, understanding uh, the dynamics in an industry requires a level of expertise that, of course, sitting here in New York, I wouldn't have. But fortunately, with Sir Terry Leahy, arguably one of the most successful retailers in the history of the UK retail sector through his tenure at Tesco, joined Clayton Dubolier probably a decade ago, and he will be the chairman of Morrison's and will be leading that company to do a number of, we hope, innovative, constructive, positive shifts that will provide better value to our customers and strengthen the brand of Morrison's while not disrupting the many wonderful things that the uh, Morrison brand has brought both to the farmers in the UK that have a unique relationship with Morrison's compared to other UK supermarkets and of course our loyal employees and, and customers. And I don't wanna underestimate the risks in any business and the supermarket business, as you know, is a relatively lower margin and historically lower growth business than many others. And very competitive in the UK as well, yeah. And, but you know, we operate in most of our sectors in competitive, with competitive uh, businesses, but that's the nature of business. Right? I mean, there are relatively few businesses that have monopoly or monopsony power. And those that are, are not going to be ones that private equity is going to participate in. So the key is, are private equity firms prepared? Do they have the capabilities to be blunt? Do they really know what they're doing? And can they add value to the company and support the management teams to take the next step in a company's growth and success? Now, Having done this at Clayton Dubalier for over 30 years in healthcare, in industrials, 
uh, in technology in, in consumer uh, and retail. And having done it successfully in the UK and, and in a number of European companies, as well as in the United States, we think that we sort of have seen a number of the patterns in the companies that we're buying in and the macro environments in which they are operating in. And that gives us some confidence that our ownership period is going to be a positive one. Not because we're unduly optimistic. You can't be unduly optimistic and be a successful investor. If you listen to our investment committees as we are debating whether to buy any business, particularly one that's in the public arena, all the debate is about risk, reward, opportunity. And if you don't answer that in the generic, you answer it in terms of individual product lines and SKUs and distribution channels and supply chain questions and pricing and inflation and competitors. So it's a complicated set of assessments, mm -hmm. but the best private equity firms exhibit what I would call very good product, uh, sorry, uh, pattern recognition skills. We've been in industries that have similar dynamics. We've sometimes been in the same industry and in the same country. And that gives our teams the confidence to offer advice and support to the management team to take steps that sometimes seem just a little bit uncomfortable. And during the pandemic, as an example, we encouraged all of our portfolio companies to, as we called it, go on the offense. Not to just worry about, well, let's respond by cutting costs. Let's respond by shrinking. On the contrary, we drew the opposite conclusion, which is assuming we understand the segment and have confidence in the management team, we should be encouraging those teams to make add-on acquisitions, to introduce new products, to do what they can to gain share. And that means investing in the brand, investing in the team, investing in the channel, and so it's a little bit of a contrarian strategy uh, in the middle of a pandemic, but our experience in each of our financial crises has been look forward, look ahead, think about growth, not retrenchment. And remember, PE has a unique set of shareholding and governance relationships that makes that possible. We have a stable shareholder base, as you know, because you teach it to yeah. your students every day, right? our limited partners are signing up for a five or 10 year period. They don't measure us in EPS. One of our great advantages is we literally don't look at EPS until our companies are close to going public. We're looking at building value over extended period of time. And although we mark to market, it's not based on EPS and it's a much longer term perspective. And that's just an incredible advantage dealing through periods of crisis. So that shareholder base has been very, very helpful. I think another element of this is we've maintained what I call healthy leverage, that is levels of debt. Mm -hmm. And I won't say the industry as a whole always follows that rule, but after a couple of crises, firms that have been around for 20 or 30 years recognize that the incremental turn of leverage to show a higher internal rate of return just isn't worth it. And so fortunately, if you think about the lessons learned through this last pandemic, we've had healthy capital structures that haven't been unduly stressed. We, had, we have almost 40 companies, only a few really suffered major capital structure stress. The rest were able to live within their capital structure and with a combination of good management initiatives, in some cases, government support, and some very, very good leadership on the behalf of the CEOs and the senior teams of many of our companies. They've grown into that leverage comfortably, and that has not been a source of distress. So Indeed. all of those things come into play. Yeah. Indeed. I mean, the levels of leverage were significantly lower this time compared to the period during the global financial crisis. And one, one other development um, following this pandemic is this increased pressure on businesses to improve their green credentials. And this pressure is coming from everybody, from investors now, from regulators, and now even from the wider public. And uh, very recently, we had the Glasgow Climate Conference here in the UK. And one of the speakers, Larry Fink, uh, argued uh, that, you know, 
calling on public companies to move forward on climate change without putting pressure on the rest of the society to create, uh, you know, to, to follow the same rules could create actually a very large arbitrage. Um, and that's the case if, if private companies do not follow the same rules as public companies with respect to their green credentials. And um, do you think he's right? Do you think that, uh, you know, private owned high emitting companies will avoid the scrutiny and generate better returns? Um, kind of what do you think is the private equities industry role in, in ensure that we, you know, have a smooth transition towards a lower carbon economy? Well, you know, I speak, of course, for myself, but I believe that a uh, that carbon is going to be one of the big business and social stories of the mm -hmm. 21st century. It just seems unavoidable, whether you like or don't like the recent targets that are set, whether you believe or don't believe when we will be target neutral, the shift in the environment, uh, both public opinion, certainly lawmakers in in most, if not all, jurisdictions have made every business think much more seriously about environmental concerns and climate change. It, by the way, is extended also to social and governance issues, but let me stay for a moment uh, on your question. And I'm not sure that Larry is correct that the arbitrage is going to be there. And I say that because the pressure on PE firms to be serious about reducing their carbon footprint and being environment responsible, not just with carbon, but with wastewater and other forms of air pollution is not just a throwaway and you can't green wash a lot of these things. You've got to remember private equity firms go to market about every four or five years mm -hmm. to sophisticated investors, many of whom like state pension funds or in, in country sovereign funds, care a lot about these issues. If you expect to raise capital from most state pension funds in the United States or any one of a number of European country sovereign funds, uh, or truthfully, any of the private sources of capital, for example, in Scan most of the Scandinavian countries, you have to be serious about maintaining your ESG credentials. And that requires both hard work, investment, maybe foregoing short-term profits. Mm -hmm. But I'd argue that private equity is better able to do that than public companies. I'd argue that on a performance basis, PE firms can afford to invest in sensible green initiatives better than public companies because no one's going to measure us on our short-term draft. You know, we've owned companies that the core of their business is to be more environmentally friendly. Mm -hmm. We have had a company called Mauser in the Germany and in the United States, and they transported specialty chemicals. And the company was able to shift a lot of the large containers, some as large as uh, you know, rail cars, to a more economic, I mean, environmentally friendly uh, uh, sort of footing by having the containers recycled. Hmm. And instead of having them thrown away, they are treated, washed, returned with an enormous impact. Now, that turns out to have been good business for us. Just think about it. Our customers are typically chemical companies themselves under enormous pressure. Yeah. And so we can say to them, look, we're doing the right thing. You're doing the right thing. You can tell your customers and importantly, employees, look at the impact measured in a lot of ways. And believe me, PE firms are very good at taking credit. <laughs> measure, yeah. measure. This is a big impact. And Mauser is just one example. And so sometimes there are flat out trade-offs of invest for no return. But I think one of the things that private equity scale allows is we can invest in the most promising technologies for carbon ca capture or recycling. And it's good for our employees, it's good for our customers. And it's not at all clear that that's bad for the bottom line. And so, you know, I suggest for one of your student papers, they should actually extend the 
which I'll call the think analysis and find out which way the arbitrage goes. Because I'll put my money on that private equity firms will actually be more successful than public ones. Again, because of our shareholder base, our agility and our longer term sort of investment perspective. Indeed, I mean, I can attest to that. Um, I think the, the, the governance mechanisms that we have in private equity, the fact that you fully control a company and the board allows you to make changes pretty quickly sometimes without, as you, as you mentioned, the fear of you know, worrying about the short term financial performance, because sometimes financial performance suffers when you invest in the business. I mean, I would like to get some questions for the audience, but before we do that, so I encourage our participants to put some questions in the Q&A section for Don. But before we do that, I wanted to ask you one more question. And, you know, given your long experience in private equity, and uh, I, I wanted to, to ask you about the future opportunities that you see in this industry. This is an industry that has been growing dramatically over the last few years. Sometimes I show in my class how fast the private equity industry has been growing relative to the hedge fund industry, which has been stagnating since 2010. Uh, so are there still opportunities in, this, in, the, in the industry for our students? And what advice would you give them uh, to those students that want to start a career in private equity today? Well, again, because the industry changes all the time, there's no, there are no permanent answers here, but I'll, I'll cite a couple of data points along the way. I, I joined Clayton Dubalier in 1989. And Martin Dubalier, one of our founders and I, went up to the Harvard Business School Venture Capital Club. Mm -hmm. Private equity was not a phrase that even existed, but there were VC firms, certainly well-established at the time. And Marty had started Clayton Dubalier with Joe Rice in 1978. So our firm was 10 years old. And the firms, when we started, we had $50 million of capital. And then 10 years later, we had 300 million, still very, very small by current standards. So at the VC club, there were probably 100 people in the audience. It wasn't that popular at the Harvard Business School. I mean, I don't remember the size of the class then at the time, but obviously multiples, maybe it was closer to eight or 900 at the time, maybe more. And Marty started by saying, gee, this is very encouraging to see all people here interested in what became known as private equity, private capital, venture capital. But Marty said, I don't want to disappoint you, but there are more people in this room than there's likely to be jobs in all the private equity in the next year. And that's because the structure of the industry at that time was very, very different. Now, there may have been a couple hundred private equity firms, mostly VC firms, but many of them not, would not even register to, to hire out of a business school. There were probably 30 PE firms hiring mm -hmm. in the country, in just the United States. And I'm sure the parallels in Europe were, would be even more dramatic. And yet today we have 8,000 firms. And when I joined Clayton Dubalier in 1989, a number of my colleagues said, oh, too bad. You missed the window. You're way too late. <laughs> uh, you know, I uh, uh, am smart enough uh, not to remind some of those friends of those predictions. Uh, and I'm not about to tell you that CDNR's growth of the 50 X times from when I joined to today will be replicated again. The large numbers obviously don't support it. But importantly, if you believe in the structural advantages that private equity has over public companies, there's no reason why the, the industry won't do very well. And just to repeat some of the themes that we've talked about, we do have a stable shareholder base. We have, I'd argue, better governance, which does lead to speed, agility, changes of direction, all very helpful. We have the ability to be very demanding on talent. CDNR or a good firm comes in and they assess the capabilities needed. And we don't mind hiring new people. Sometimes you have to change out people if they're really not suited for the next generation of changes in an environment and in competition. But that's a big advantage. We also have flexibility on compensation. We're not under the same scrutiny uh, in, in many ways that public companies are. We can differentiate more. We can create a different level of incentives. We can create better alignment and one of the things that was originally 
identified in some of the early work on private equity uh, by Jensen, among others, and I'm sure that's on your students' reading list, is just the alignment of having managers own direct equity in the business for which they can make substantial gains. So you look at those things and then you just look at leverage. You know, if it's used prudently, which may be four times, five times, six times leverage versus a more traditional public company that's penalized in the market by using that level of leverage, it gives you an example of some of the arbitrage that's still available for private equity. Now, that said, We'd be foolish not to believe in the laws of supply and demand and with 8,000 funds and probably a billion, I mean, a trillion dollars, $4 trillion of, of assets under management and available. And we talk about dry powder. Prices go up, returns come down, <laughs> inevitable. But again, you're looking at 8,000 firms. Now- It's a mature firm, asset class. It's a big, big asset class. And what matters, of course, if you're a private equity investor is choosing the best managers. Not easy to do. When I joined the firm. We had five operating partners. Today, we have 26. We have sub-sector specialists. So when COVID hits or any crisis hits, and we're now dealing with supply chain and with, with pricing and inflation, we have an operating executive in the industry sub-segment who has lived through this before. We can provide a level of support to a um, portfolio company that typically public companies don't have those resources. And I think most good operating, most good, most good private equity firms as research has shown that can actually deploy operating expertise in a meaningful way outperform. So related to the operational expertise that you have, one of the questions from Evelyn, Evelyn, uh, she's asking, uh, how do you see the impact of the digital business model and digital value creation in PE evolving? And I, I know that a lot of private equity firms are looking at digital tools and uh, ways of creating value through digitalization. Very good question. And if you look at a content analysis of our operating reviews or our investment committees over the last 10 years, you will see a dramatic increase in the discussion, concerns, and assessment of the impact of technology, which very often is a substitute for the word digitization, uh, on, on the businesses that either we seek to invest in or the ones we already own. So it started as a relatively clear set of assessments. Will Amazon compete against this business? Now, those are hard assessments, but they're relatively narrow. Increasingly, the, the Evelyn's question is asking, well, what else does technology bring? And as individual tools, we can evaluate that. We owned uh, both Brakes Brothers in the UK and US Food Service in the United States. And we went from our salespeople, literally with a pen or pencil and a uh, paper order form to today where, of course, everything is done online with a uh, some kind of a, a, an iPad device or a phone and there's standing orders and there's all kinds of internal checks and there's marketing and there's all linked to the supply chain, dramatically better for every element of the process. And you know, a PE firm or any firm has got to invest in that technology and in the digitization. Now I'm not talking about either uh, sort of financial services industries that have a whole different element. But it's not too much of a stretch to say every one of our businesses is very much laser focused on what does digitization and technology do with our relationship with our customers and our supply chain, because that is changing dramatically. And unless we're investing in businesses that can keep that technological edge, we're just going to fall behind because others will. Mm -hmm. Now, we're able to do that both because of the new partners that we bring into the firm and because we increasingly are investors in technology businesses that serve the rest of the industry. Epicor, for example, is a terrific business that serves manufacturing and distribution businesses and provides them with a re remarkable set of tools to manage everything about their business from our supply chain right through to the customer. And that's the business of Epicor, but that's the business in some ways of every uh, enterprise that we own. So 
you know, I measure it again as content and, and focus uh, and increasingly as investment. And so I don't think it's too much of an overstatement, although I'm doing it for dramatic effect, to say every business we invest in is a technology business. It's a software business. It's a business ripe for further digitization. And that makes life a little more complex, but it also makes it more exciting because if you succeed, you have better service, lower costs, more engagement with your customer. So thank you for the question. Thank you. Our one last question, and I know that we are slightly running out of time, but I feel it's a very important question and we would really appreciate your insights on that. Um, I wanted to ask, so a couple of students are asking about the democratization trend of private equity, the fact that some companies like Moonfair allow retail investors to invest in private equity. How do you think access of retail investors will affect the private equity industry? Well, it, complicated question. And when I heard the word democratization, I thought you were going to be talking about equity participation by employees. Oh. And that has been an important element of many PE firms. And my prediction is that you'll see more of that. That's a different mm -hmm. question than the one that was asked. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think the access uh, for a retail investor is complicated. The few chances that investors have had in the past, I remember is probably the early 90s uh, that Merrill Lynch, among others, offered some direct retail participation. It's hard, I think, for a retail investor to understand, not that they're not sophisticated, but to live through the J curve, typical of most PE firms, and to watch valuations go down necessarily or before they go up. So <laughs> it's not a natural high octane retail product. Uh -huh. uh, and so I think the question for regulators is how to ensure that investors are well informed about the dynamics of private equity. It's not that complicated, but it has been an institutional asset class for a reason. You need a long-term perspective. I mean, how many people would want to buy into a public company equity if they were told you can't sell it for 10 years? <laughs> and, you know, that would not be the marketing pitch, I think, <laughs> that most people trying to get retail investors in, but that's the truth of it. We're in an yeah. illiquid asset class. So, you know, I would love opportunities to have more investors benefit directly from PE. Many, by the way, benefit indirectly because they're members oh, of yeah. pension, pension plans or any one, a number of other ways. But the direct investment, unless it's pooled in some way and described sensibly, uh, I think, it's just complicated. It, by the way, I think it's inevitable because I think people will package it and create different synthetic and other vehicles. But the only reason that I'm hesitant in it, rather than saying, great, more money, give me more money to manage, is that I'm not sure that the in, in, retail investors can really live with the level of illiquidity uh, that private equity has. It's a great advantage of private equity. We're not about to give it up. And I can see some firms that want that money might be willing to offer more interim liquidity, but I don't think the industry generally is going to go that way. So to me, if I had to project five years, I would think retail investors will still be a very, very small part of the private equity asset base. And probably an, an unfortunate byproduct of that will be over-regulation of the industry, right? Because that's usually what happens when retail money comes in. Thank you so much, Don, and I apologize for running a little bit out of time, but it was such a fascinating uh, discussion and, you know, you shared with us a lot of very interesting insights. Really appreciate your time. And thanks for, for, for sharing your time, your valuable time with our students at London Business School. And we hope to host you next time face to face. Well, I would love to do that, especially since uh, if you hold it at the same time, my guess is at the end of the session, if we were face to face now, we would uh, go into uh, a room next door to the one you're in now and we'd have drinks together, which- Yeah, yeah we'll have a little reception. What you see behind me is actually the front garden of London Business School. 
And just in front of that garden, you actually see the Regent's Park. So it's a great location in London. <laughs> it is a, uh, a great location. Well, I appreciate it. And uh, I hope this was uh, useful. I had uh, a meeting today with a student that uh, was in the audience when I gave a PE presentation about 10 years ago. And uh, he, in fact, ended up going on to uh, a good career and he's still at a private equity firm. But he made me worry a little bit about my presentation today because <laughs> said, do you remember what you said 10 years ago? <laughs> and I said, no, <laughs> not because I don't have memories, but I, I don't know what I told you about private equity 10 years ago. And he told me exactly what I said. And it made me think, gee, you know, what I said today, is that going to stand up 10 years from now? I hope so. <laughs> and I hope I haven't led any of you astray. But as I said, I'm basing this on 33 years of experience, pattern recognition, a sense that this industry is gonna be good to many people for many years. And while that is not, no one answered that, asked that question directly, I think there's plenty of reason for many of the students uh, that I'm speaking with today to try to pursue PE careers if you are intrigued by what those models look like, because I think the industry is gonna be do very well for an extended period of time. Thank you so much, and on that high note, thank you so much, and uh, we hope to see you soon in London, then. That'd be great. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. You.